Hello and welcome to my channel. In this channel, we explain various Nasin concepts in a simple form for better and easy understanding. These videos could be used by both LPN and RN students, as well as nurses who are trying to refresh their basic concepts. My name is Nas Mosh. In this video, we are going to talk about various GI procedures. Fast Total Parental Nutrition, TPN for short. So TPN is normally used with a patient who has issues with malnutrition, malabsorption, being in a hypermetabolic state, as well as patients who require to be NPO for a prolonged amount of time. TPN is normally administered through a central line, for example, a peak line, never through an arterial line. Nursing consideration. We normally gradually increase or decrease the flow rate of TPN. So when we increase it too fast, the patient could be in a risk of being in a hypoglycemic state. And when you decrease it, the rate too fast, now gradually the patient could go in into a hypoglycemic state. We also change the tubing and the bag every 24 hours. Most people do it in the night. We use a micro filter in the tubing. We closely monitor the patient's eyes and ores. Remember, whenever we are infusing some fluid into a patient the patient is in a risk of either going into fluid overload right so we need to know if we are giving them the fluid are they excreting it well and since tpn is high in glucose we also want to know that there is no uh, electrolyte shift with the patient we weigh them daily we also check their electrolyte levels as well as their blood glucose so when we first put a patient on tpn their first initial 24 hours on tpn we normally check their blood glucose levels every four to six hours remember we are checking for uh, to prevent the patient to get into a hyperglycemic state one of the most common questions in regards to tpn is troubleshooting and the question will go like if you're a nurse on a floor your patient is having um, TPN continuous infusion and you go to check you don't have the TPN bag ready of course you will call the pharmacy to get the TPN delivered but what are you going to do in the meantime since the TPN is complete what we normally do is we hang or we start infusing doctors 10% and this is to prevent the patient from going through into a hypoglycemic state remember TPN is high in glucose and also when TPN is running through the peak line that line is only dedicated to the TPN we don't do blood drawals we don't do IV medication administration to that line it's only dedicated to TPN and we also monitor the site for signs and symptoms of infection so always know when you're infusing anything with sugar there is high risk for pathogens to grow there because that sugar is food right so we check for infections and some of these signs will be on the side of where the peak is you'll see redness you'll feel it's warm you, the patient will feel pain it will be either irritated so always uh, check for these signs and symptoms for infection and if you note any sign of infection please let the medical doctor know nasogastric tubes NG tubes for short are another GI diagnostic procedures. It's normally placed on a patient who has an intestinal blockage. And some of the signs and symptoms of intestinal blockage will be, of course, abdominal pain, will have also distension, vomiting, and abnormal bowel sounds. That means you could have presence of bowel sounds, bowel sounds that are not normal to that patient. So the intention for placing this G-tube into the patient is to suck out or remove out all the gastric contents and allow for the bowel to decompress and also rest. Because remember, when you have food, these signals send that this food is there, we're going to start to work on the food, breaking it down. But if you have a blockage, the whole intestinal system is receiving the signal but some of the intestinal systems cannot process the food as they are supposed to because the food is not going to get to them so after you place the ng tube in the patient we will always do an x-ray placement remember you don't want this g tube uh ng tube moving because if the ng tube it goes through your nose right we normally measure it from the nose you put it straight ahead over the patient's cheek behind the patient's ear and you bring it all the way down to the 
xiphoid process. That's how you measure the measurement that you need to insert the NG tube. So we normally mark it after you place it, you put a mark. So when you see the mark has moved, you know it's not where it's supposed to be. And there is a high risk of aspiration if this NG tube moves. In case you flush it, you're going to be sending that water into the patient's lungs. So we don't want that. So we, we always send the patient to or x-ray to see the placement is right, right? And also you could perform this with aspiration of the gastric content. So you'll remove, aspirate the gastric content, place it on a pH strip, and it will indicate if the contact will normally be acidic. But with patients, it varies because every patient is different. I can't tell you what level of acidic it will be, but gastric content is acidic. When assessing a patient with an NG tube, we are going to take a look at abdominal girth, okay? We always measure the abdominal girth. Every time you're doing the patient assessment, measure the abdominal girth. Because if the abdomen is continuing to distend, then that NG tube is not doing its job. Or we're going to listen to the bowel sounds, right? We're going to monitor the NG tube for placement, right? We're going to check the nasal mucosa for breakage because this NG tube is going through the nasal. And most of the time, if the patient will have an NG tube for a longer duration, NG tube is not recommended for a long-term solution. So it's normally a short-term period, but with patients, depending on if it's a pediatric patient, you see there's nasal mucosa irritation. We normally switch it to the other nostril to prevent the skin breakdown, and then you'll be dealing with other issues apart from the blockage. We also monitor the patient's eyes and ears, electrolytes, and encourage them to ambulate. With ambulation, it increases bowel motility. You gotta keep moving, right? So with abdominal obstruction, normally what happens with the bowel sounds, you will hear hyper, meaning that is overdrive of the bowel sounds above the obstruction, but below there's nothing because there's nothing going on. So over here at the top where before you get to where the obstruction is, we are working so hard to break this food down. But down here, there's no food going. So nothing is happening down there. So there's no bowel sounds. You will hear no bowel sounds. So ostomies is another GI procedure normally performed. And an ostomy is performed when a patient's bowel is injured or there is a disease present and part of that bowel needs to be removed. So it's not functioning well or it's not functioning how it's supposed to function. And there are two types of ostomies which can be performed. It could be either be an ileostomy or a colostomy. So an ileostomy is normally created on the ileum. It's an opening in the ileum, which is the part of the small intestines. And the colostomy is normally an opening, which is, it is not normally, it is an opening in the colon, which is the large intestine. So with ileostomy, since it's the small intestines, that means we've not started bulking our excretion, right? So with the ileostomy output, we'll have much liquidy output more than the colostomy, which will be more formed and bulky, right? Some key points to remember with uh, ostomy care. So we always inspect the stoma. It should be red, pink, or even they sometimes say beefy red. It needs to be moist. We don't need to see any pearl or purple color. This indicates in impaired blood flow to the area. So if you see the stoma is bluish, purplish color, and it does not look like fresh meat, let's put buffy red we got a problem we need to let the physician know immediately it's a it's an emergency we need to empty the bag when it's a quarter to a half full so the issue with the bag is the more the more output we have in the bag the higher the risk of it burning the stomach right it's not supposed to be there you're not supposed to be sitting on your poop so the more the bag is the higher the risk of you burning your stoma or the skin around the stoma being irritated. And also, the fuller it is, the more easy for the operators to pull out of the skin and, you know, fall. Right. And then the patient can use a breath mint. This one, it depends, you know. Patient can use a breath mint in the bag to decrease the odor. And also sometimes it's better to advise the patient to avoid foods that, you know, have bad odor after you eat them, like eggs.
when changing the appliance, the appliance is the, the colostomy setup. We normally refer them to the appliance. We cut the opening in the skin barrier no more than an eighth of an inch bigger than the stomach. So we don't want to strangle the stomach. We want sufficient area where the stomach will fit in a good circumference. It's not being strangulated and it's not oversized so that it's just too much of exposure. To prevent this, we always measure. Measure the patient's stomach before you go cut the appliance, okay? So the last um, GI procedure we're going to talk about in this video, we'll continue in the next video, is paracentesis. Paracentesis uh, involves the insertion of a needle through the abdomen to remove fluid from the perinatal cavity. Perinatal cavity is your abdominal cavity. This is primarily done to patients with ascites who have fluid retention in their perinatal cavity. And it's normally due to an issue with cirrhosis or liver dysfunction. So some of the nursing care you need to perform to this patient include prior to the procedure, ensure the patient signs a consent form. Remember, it's an invasive procedure, so we need consent before we do any invasive procedure. We also have the patient void prior to the procedure. We don't want a distended bladder because with a distended bladder, there's a high risk of you know, during the procedure, you can nick the bladder. So to avoid a secondary issue from this procedure, we have them void. We always measure the patient's vital signs, weight, abdominal gut circumference. Always we do this before and after. Since we want to see how much fluid we've removed and what are the changes, there is also a risk in um, fluid shift with the patient. So we want to be very careful with this. So we always monitor the patient for hypovolemia since we are removing fluid from them. And after the procedure. This is cause the perinatal fluid being removed from your patient is high in protein so we can cause a fluid shift in the body. So since we are removing this protein right and protein will cause the shift we always most of the time administer albumin which is also a volume expander and a protein as prescribed by the doctor thank you for watching please like share and subscribe to my channel see you on the next one bye